Some people get mad at me when I say this, but I think almost every male could have a 40 inch vertical if you do at least four out of five of these things. All right, so first one, jump practice. Total amount of hours, right? So those who accumulate a lot of specific jump reps throughout their lifetime tend to be the best jumpers. Those who are obsessed become the best, all right? So all these guys that I assess that are 45 inch vertical, 50 inch vertical, when I ask them, what did you do growing up? They say, I jumped, right? There's a lot of different training backgrounds. Some people lifted heavy, some people didn't, but all of them say, hey, I grew up on low rims dunking. I grew, I was always that kid trying to touch the ceiling, always trying to touch a little bit higher. They are consistently the most obsessed with jumping higher. That's prerequisite number one. You gotta be obsessed and then you gotta go out and actually get the reps. Even if you have really bad genetics, if you get a lot of reps, your mechanics are gonna be really, really good and you're, you're gonna jump pretty high just off that alone. Next up, genetics. So we're talking about muscle fiber type, fast twitch versus slow twitch. Uh, we could change that a little bit with the right type of training, um, but a lot of that is genetics that we can't change. Uh, muscle tendon insertion sites, anthropometrics, so how long my femurs are relative to my tibia, all of this stuff goes into how good of a jumper we are, how long our feet are relative to our height, um, Achilles length, uh, all of these things do matter and you're not gonna change these things. Now, this is why I say you need four out of five because a lot of you saw this and you're like, oh, well, I was never the genetic freak naturally, then there's no way I can get a, a approach 40 inch vertical, it's impossible. I also did not have this naturally. All through high school, I couldn't dunk, never got an in-game dunk, and then once I started training the right way, gained 12 inches, started throwing down windmills, 360s, all that. I didn't have the genetics, it wasn't natural for me, um, but I did the other four out of five things so well that I didn't need the genetics to get well above a 40 inch vertical. Number three, and this one is really, really important, early childhood exposure to multiple movements in sports. Ages one through 12 has some movement skill acquisition windows that close later on and you can't make up for it later on or it's very tough. To make, on, uh, to make up for it later on. So if you were that kid who was just like playing video games until age 12, never playing sports, never outside playing tag, it's really hard to go back and make up those windows. Um, and so the kids who are very active at an early age, outside playing tag, multiple sports, it doesn't even have to specifically be like a crazy amount of specific jump reps. You just have to be active, and moving and athletic in general. Now, I'm not saying playing video games is bad. I'm saying if that's the main thing that you did and you got 20 minutes of exercise every day, it's gonna be a low probability that you're gonna be a freak athlete later on in life. Still possible. Like I said, four out of five. Maybe you miss this window, but you do the other four really well. Number four is training. So strength training, plyometrics, sprinting, additional jump mechanics work, mobility work. It needs to be periodized into a progressive year-round program, rinse and repeat for five to 10 years to reach your true genetic potential. Number five is body composition. You could do the other four things that I mentioned, but if you have a lot of excess body fat, you'll likely ruin your bounce. Fat don't fly. We have a whole program for that. Personally, I gain 1.8 inches for every five pounds that I lose, as long as I'm losing that in fat and my muscle isn't wasted and I keep my force production the same. There was actually a study that showed it was somewhere between 1.5 and two inches for every five pounds uh, that they lost. Now, this is gonna be different for everybody, but for me, my average is 1.8, um, usually, I'll lose like 15 pounds at a time over like a two month span. So if I were to do a cycle of our Fat Don't Fly program, which is eight weeks, I'm probably gonna lose around 16 pounds. I'm going for two pounds per week. But the key on that program is uh, I'm in a slight caloric deficit and my macro and micronutrients are still high, so I'm not becoming depleted. And then we prioritize strength training. So sometimes I actually get stronger on the program, even though I'm losing weight. 
And usually my first five pounds, I gain more than 1.8. I'll usually be a little bit above two inches. And then the next five pounds that I lose might be 1.8. And then the, the final five pounds that I lose is less. It'll be closer to one or maybe up to 1.5. But typically for me, there's a point of diminishing returns and I don't keep gaining that 1.8 for every five pounds. I don't know exactly why that is. Uh, I would guess that as I continue to lose weight, I do become slightly more depleted. And at some point you are gonna lose some muscle. So the closer I get to being like extremely lean, there's gonna be some muscle loss no matter how good your training and nutrition is. So maybe at that point, I continue to lose half fat, half muscle. My force production doesn't actually go up. Um, and so uh, the, the relative force production ends up going down. Um, and I eventually will start either losing or just maintaining balance. But regardless of those little nitty gritty details, just know that if you have excess body fat and you lose it, you're gonna jump higher. Now, for the, the teens listening to this who are still growing, you do gotta be cautious because you need a lot of energy to grow. Um, and so if you get on a, a strict diet that's restricting calories, you could potentially be stunning growth messing with hormones, it's not a great uh, place to be in. And then also, even if you're not growing, it's very bad for your body to just be in a constant caloric deficit. So when I run a Fat Don't Fly program and I enter a caloric deficit, it's a short period of time. Like I'll go four weeks, I might take a week off in between uh, reverse dieting, go back to maintenance, and then go into a deficit for the next four weeks. And then I don't go back on a diet for quite a while. Um, because you want to give your metabolism time to heal. Otherwise, you'll just stunt your metabolism. That's bad. I've been there before. And it's, it's very unhealthy to, uh, for your health to be in a caloric deficit for too long or to be in a huge caloric deficit. I, I, I try to make the caloric deficit small enough to where I don't lose more than two pounds per week. If I'm losing more than two pounds per week, or I think people will recommend like 1% of your body weight, if I'm losing more than 1% of my body weight per week, I'm in too big of a caloric deficit and it's fun while it's lasting, but then eventually your metabolism is gonna shut down um, your NEAT, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis will change. So you actually burn less throughout the day. Uh, what used to be standing now becomes sitting. What used to be sitting now becomes laying down. There's less fidgeting. There's less energy up around the house doing the dishes. Um, this is one of the body's adaptations when you're in a super big caloric deficit because it's trying to save your life. It's saying, hey, if you keep losing at this rate, some, uh, eventually we're going to die. And so I'm going to slow everything down and I'm going to make sure that your metabolism is slower and you don't burn as much, uh, you don't burn as much calories during your physical activity. And y while you're resting, you're going to fidget less, you're going to lay down more, et cetera. So... That was a good rant, but very necessary. Also in this post, I did mention that there is a big genetic component to how much fat you're going to store. The best jumpers in the world are typically under 10%, but that might not be you. Right now at 35, my natural set point is so much higher. Like if I just don't train and just eat like a decent diet, I'll be well above 15%, probably closer to 20. And so for me to get under 10%, I got to go pretty hard on the diet. Um, and so it's not as healthy for me to diet down and stay under 10% year round. I can do that for a short period of time. But there's some guys that I train who their natural set point, if their diet is terrible and they're not training at all, their natural set point is like 12%. So they just have to put in a little effort, like maybe don't go to McDonald's once and eat chicken instead and they're gonna get down under 10% really easy. So it's actually very healthy for them to maintain under 10% year round, right? It's a myth that being lean is unhealthy in itself. Uh, it depends on your genetic set point and how hard you had to diet to get down to that point. I always say relatively lean. That means lean for you, not lean for John ja Morant or as you see in this picture, Mac McClung. You might not be that lean ever, and that's okay. Be lean for you, and don't kill yourself to get there.
And number six, this is a bonus, jumpers mentality. Believe in it and your body is more likely to achieve it. It sounds cliche, but it is true. When I went through periods in my career where I was jumping the highest, I remember literally going to bed and just dreaming about doing windmill dunks, doing East Bays. Like, that's all I would think about. And I would see myself doing it, and I believed that I can do it, and it makes it a lot easier for the body to actually achieve it, right? We try to separate brain and body. You can't do that. Your physiology, everything in your body is controlled by the nervous system. So when you have these psychological barriers, like I can't dunk or whatever it is, I can't do a windmill, once you finally get over those psychological barriers, now the training is going to be two times more effective because the body is ready to make adaptations because it actually believes that you can do it. So that is another one that I've seen in the best jumpers in the world. They all have that jumpers mentality. They're always looking for another inch on their vertical and they're always visualizing themselves getting there and they don't have these self-imposed beliefs that a lot of the rest of the world has. All right, guys, that's it for today's video. If you want an entire program to lock in and train with me and transform your vertical jump, I got a couple different options. One for Hoopers Unranked is probably our best option right now, year-round strength and conditioning, athleticism, skills training, it's got everything. But it's great for Hoopers because we build a lot of your athleticism with a ball in your hand, so you actually get better at layups at the same time. You improve your agility on the court, your speed, on the court. Um, now we also have Vert Code Elite, which is the classic program. Um, thousands and thousands have gotten crazy results on Vert Code Elite. That is also a full year program. We have Vert Code Body Weight, which is our entry level program. If you just want to get gains from home, you don't have access to weights or you're not ready to lift yet, Vert Code Body Weight has worked for a lot of athletes. We have Fat Don't Fly. So, like I was mentioning, if you have a lot of excess fat to drop, um, and that's the limiting factor for you jumping high. This program will get you stronger. It's a full body strength program, comes with diet information. So lock in for eight weeks and take your body to the next level, which then takes your athleticism to the next level as a byproduct. And then the final one, we actually have the Mac McClung program. That's a great program that's like a supplement to the Vert Code or Vert Code Elite. If you've already done those programs, let's say you've done Vert Code Elite, unranked you've done all that the mac mcclung is a great 12-week program very similar concepts to the vert code elite and to the unranked the only difference is the specific exercise selection this is what mac mcclung did as a kid growing up i've been working with mac uh, for a couple years now he's gotten good results training with me but he was already a freak athlete um, and so he's like, look, whatever I did, I really feel like worked, but I want you to put together all the regressions, progressions, and coach the program. And so we collaborated, and that's called the Mac McClung Jump Program. All right, guys, let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Until next time, I'm out.